welcome back to Bangkok Chit Chat. Uh, as you may have seen in our last show, we had Tony Davis. Uh, we're at, talking about the, the world situation, militarily, etc., and what's happening around the world. Uh, and now we're going to look at more the, the regional side of Southeast Asia uh, on what's happening here. But we'll, we'll talk about Myanmar, we'll talk about Thailand, Cambodia, and just generally about the region. So, Tony, a question. You'd, you'd mentioned that you focus, you have a focus in southern, southern Thailand, yeah? Can you tell me a little bit more about the insurgents and, and what's actually happening there? What, what, what is the purpose, what are the objectives within southern Thailand? Southern Thailand is, is sort of, is, it's like the poor, it's always with us, right? It just doesn't seem to go away. But if you compare the level of conflict now with what was happening 10 years ago, mm. there's been a dramatic decline. Yeah. And anybody in the Thai military will tell you this and, and be proud of that. Um, that said, there is still an ongoing, I won't say it's daily, but it's certainly every week, there are gonna be IED bomb incidents, there are gonna be shootings, there is ongoing insurgent organized violence, right? Um, and try as they have and will, the Thai military seems to be having a real problem finishing this off, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and there, there is, you know, it, it's a fundamental, it's one of those sort of uh, points in Asia where cultures collide. Right, um, and in the south you have Malay Muslim culture colliding with Thai Buddhist culture. Another example would be uh, Rakhine Bangladesh border uh, on the border of Bangladesh and Myanmar, right, where you have Buddhist Burman culture colliding with Muslim uh, Bengali culture. So it's a fundamental fault line. And because of that, this isn't going to be solved easily. And there is enough ongoing dissatisfaction or skepticism among the Malay Muslim population of the three provinces, right, as regards Thai administration. There is enough of that left that it will sustain a continuing level of violence. But what are the, I don't quite understand, what are the, the insurgents groups looking for and what is the... Well, the, 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 uh, essentially the, there is only one insurgent group. T traditionally, historically, there have been quite a few. Yeah. Today we're talking one group called BRN, Barisan Revolusi Nacional, National Revolutionary Front. BRN is on paper and if you talk to any of them, they, which I have done offshore, not in Thailand, um, they want independence. But at the same time... Of these three provinces? Of these three provinces. Well, it's sort of, it gets messy at the edges, right? I mean, do they want a bit of Songkla, a bit of the fourth province? Would Satun uh, be included or not? I mean, that's all up for grabs, but the reality is that everybody, including their own leaders, know that's just not on the table. It ain't gonna happen, mm -hmm. right? For a whole range of reasons. Domestic in terms of Thailand, Malaysia, would Malaysia want an independent state on its border? No. Would ASEAN accept that? No. This is not Timor revisited in any sense. It sort of has echoes of Aceh mm -hmm. in Indonesia, right, mm -hmm. back in the 90s and early 2000s, but it sure to hell is not Timor-Leste about to happen. So there is an ongoing problem which efforts are being made to foster dialogue between the Royal Thai government and BRN. This is happening below the, below the radar, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's happening offshore, and it may be moving in a positive direction. And there are, there are two fundamental obstacles to a resolution of the problem. One is that on the BRN side, on the Patani Malay side, 
BRN and its leaders don't really know what they want. They have never produced a short list of demands, right? It's always been Medica, independence. Well, sorry, guys, that ain't going to happen. Can we have something a little more realistic? Sounds right? a bit like Scotland in some ways. Uh, you're giving the Scottish nationalists a hard time, mate. Believe me, when you're talking BRN, you're talking serious dysfunction, right? right? These are old people living offshore in many cases who have been able to bask in this sort of glow of insurgency. We're fighting, they use the word jihad, right? Mm -hmm. not, in, not in Al Qaeda international jihadist sense, but a fight of Muslims against a infidel oppressor, namely the Siamese, the Thais, right? So they can't, they, they've had the luxury of not having to actually say, realistically, what do you want? So that's their problem. On the Thai side, if you want to solve this, you need to be talking at some level about some form of autonomy, right? Mm -hmm. It could be linguistic autonomy. It could be making the Malay language a second language in the region, officially. Uh, it could be, I mean, th th there, are, there are various levels to this, right? Cultural, linguistic, and then most problematic, political, right? So if BRN ever got its ideological or its mental act together and said, okay, we want these three provinces to be somehow joined as one region, Patani Malay region. We're not going to have a separate country, we understand that, but it would be nice to have our own region. Now, that's a huge problem for Bangkok, right? Because if you have a new region embracing three and a bit provinces in southern Thailand, well, maybe up in the north, Lana would be interested in having their region. So it challenges the traditional structure of the Thai state in a way that the establishment in this country and the military in particular at this point are not prepared to tolerate. So both sides have problems. Autonomy on the Thai side is, can we, how can we do that? Are there ways to finesse it? And on the BRN side, can we actually get our act together and figure out a short list of realistic demands that could sh secure our future and bring peace and prosperity to our people within the context of the Thai state? See, I look at like, um I know the country Tamarat a little bit, and, and, and it seemed to the communities, the Muslim community and, and the Buddhist community, they, they, they work very well together. They, they're not bothered about all this, this sort of stuff. So the general people that are living in these three particular states, I take it there's no conflict between the Buddhist and the Muslim. Yeah? Uh, this, is, more, I mean, the, more, this is more political. It's not to do with the... Well, no, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it certainly is not religious. This is not... Right in the first instance, Buddhists and Muslims not being able to live together. Because they do. As you point out, they do in Thailand everywhere. very, very successfully everywhere, right? It's not a religious issue. This is fundamentally an ethno-nationalist issue. This is Patani Malays, right, being, as they see it, assimilated into a Thai Buddhist state. And they don't like it. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. They don't like it. They've never liked it, and they don't like it now, generally speaking. Some of them may be able to live with it. Some of them may have excellent education in Thai language and be able to do things in Thai society the same as any other Thai Buddhist could do, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of them in deprived rural communities, their first instinct is we are Patani Malays. And Patani is a particularly, it's not just Malay, Patani as a region has traditionally seen itself as quintessentially Malay. It has a tradition of Thai Kwam Ben Malayu, right? Being Malay. That is, as they see it, infinitely superior to what happens in Malaysia, right? We're the real Malays. Right. So this is, a, a, it's, it's a nut which is particularly hard for the Thai state to swallow. It's not, these are not just any Malays, these are Patani Malays. And the Mal Malaysian side? 
on the Malaysian side, you mean... Oh, How are they trying to influence the, the a solution? Or are they saying, we've well, got nothing to do with this yet? No, the, I, I mean, the, the, no, the, Malay, I mean, the Malaysian position and, and reality is they are facilitating this sort of stop again, start again process of talks. They are facilitating that. Right. Um, you know, it's been, it's been put to me that both the Thai government and BRN, the insurgents, distrust the Malaysians more than the Thais and, and BRN distrust each other, right? So the idea that Malaysia has no stake in what happens is patently absurd. Of course it does. Mm -hmm. It's right on their border. So that's, that's not necessarily an unjustifiable position. So are they simply disinterested peacemakers? No, they're not. They've got a stake in the game, right? And that worries BRN and it worries the Thais. And all three sides are going to have to sort this out if this thing is ever going to be resolved. Okay. So with regards to Thailand itself, it's gone through various coups over the years. Uh, and today what I see, I've been here, what, 33 years? Uh, and I've seen the, 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 the growing interest in politics, et cetera, of, of, of the young, et cetera, and also before where votes were bad, it's not in, this, in the same way as it was, it, as it was then. Yeah? Uh, how do you see things developing in Thailand because there's a push for constitutional change? I don't want to get into the details of the constitutional changes, but how do you see things happening in Thailand? Yeah? Well, I think if you look at the situation today, um, particularly in the context of COVID, right, and everything else that's going on, I think the Thai government is in a pretty secure, stable position. I had dinner with a, a journalist from Singapore last week, and she was asking me, do you think the government is going to be uh, overthrown, either, either through parliamentary or extra-parliamentary uh, means, later this year? Uh, oh, sorry, in, in 2022. Right, and I said no. I, I I don't think there's any chance of that whatsoever. I mean, you can you can always have surprise events, right? Um, but within that the context of life as we're sort of knowing it in the COVID era, particularly in the COVID era, given the impact on the economy, right? Mm -hmm. And and people are suffering economically, but they're not suffering in a way that, in my opinion, most of them are blaming the government. The government is seen as maybe not having done a great job, but having done a sufficient job to ameliorate the situation as far as government can to make it worthwhile having around. So I don't see any immediate push for a change of government. If you want to take the whole situation further out, beyond COVID into the mid 2020s. Yeah, you what we've seen in recent years is very clearly a growing number of youth from the middle class and from rural sector, youth across the board who want change. And Arguably, you can attribute the dramatic rise of uh, Future Forward, Anakot Mai, right? And more recently, Gao Glai. Um, the two parties are obviously linked. The rise of those parties was clearly linked to this demographic change. And Anakot Mai was effectively... Um, made illegal, right? Doesn't exist anymore. Gao Glai is still in Parliament, but change in Parliament doesn't seem to be happening mm. in any significant way that is likely to encourage the younger generation. So yeah, you, you, you do have a situation in this country which is worrying insofar as the powers that be do not appear to fully recognize the need 
for reform. Mm -hmm. And, you know, an example, it's not an example, it's, it's a basic fact, which I've sometimes discussed with people. Before the coup in 2014, when um, Sutep's crowds were on the streets, right, demonstrating against the Yingluck government of the day, the cry was reform before uh, elections, reform before elections. So then there was a coup and you had an army, a military government taking over and elections did not happen until 2019. So that's five years of military rule which you would think would have been an excellent opportunity to push through, under strong military power, reforms. Reforms of the education system, reforms of the police, reforms of the judiciary. A whole slew of reforms which in this country probably nobody would argue are not necessary, right? What happened in those five years? Nothing. There were no reforms. Committees were set up. There was discussion of reforming the police again and again. Those con discussions about reform continue, but nothing actually practically ever happens. And now we're in a semi-democratic dispensation, so we're not under military rule, which makes reform even more difficult because you're dealing with parliamentary mm -hmm. constituencies, right? And, and, and those opposed to reform being able to articulate their thoughts. Yeah, there, there, there is a problem in recognizing and then implementing necessary reforms that will allow this country to flourish and move forward. And, you know, to, to ties of our generation, that's a problem. But if you're a young tie in your 20s and 30s, it's a lot more than a problem. It's your future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And well, some people would say, was, was, was Thailand ready to have a really de democratic, democratic nation? Obviously, the youth see that, uh, whatever that is, yeah, uh, the, the youth obviously think, think it is, and, and, and the older want to remain with the status quo. Yeah, so, I mean, it, uh, and, and this is Thailand's genius, and, and to that extent, the way out of the dilemma is that Thailand is, is arguably better suited than many other societies in the region for compromise, avoiding confrontation, avoiding the sort of shit that we see down in Dindang, right? Mm. Thailand is, is, is culturally and, and mentally in a great place to avoid that sort of confrontation, but it does take a willingness to compromise on both sides. So some of the uh, demands of the, of the student movement, of the youth movement, are too much too soon. But if the response from the conservative side is to say, no, nothing ever, that's a problem as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's all compromise. Okay, just to, just to uh, briefly go into things, that what's happening in Myanmar, I read a, 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 your story before, which you, you published about what's happening in Myanmar uh, and what's going to happen in the dry season. Mm -hmm. Could you go into, you know, give us an update on what's happening in Myanmar and where you think it's going? Yeah. Uh, it's a, that's a difficult question because uh, we're, we're a month, we're not even a month into the dry season, right? The dry season starts in November. We're now on the first of, well, today is the first of December. So we're in, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're in the cold season in theory, or well, it's not that cold. Um, what is happening is basically the Myanmar military uh, has been confronted with a plethora of so-called people's defense forces, which are ethnically Burman, Bama, and in the center of the country and are violently resisting their rule. And their response is the response that you would expect from the Myanmar military, shoot the buggers, right? We're gonna go after them. And that's what's happening today and yesterday and tomorrow is you've got the Myanmar military conducting artillery, barrages and airstrikes on its own people. And 
how that plays forward in the coming months is very difficult to say. What I would say, though, is I don't think it's going to be a success, right? They may be able to tamp down the level of conflict to a degree, but they're certainly not going to be able to stamp it out. And the Myanmar military has all sorts of problems of its own, which are generally not recognized, right? So classically, it's described in any newspaper article you read as 350,000 strong. So you think, hell, what could possibly go wrong with a force that size, right? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, if you look at combat troops, you're talking probably less than 100,000, a, a third of the purported size. So when you've got as many of your own people against you, plus ethnic minority groups, which have been armed and in the field in many cases for decades, right? Kachin, Shan, uh, Kaya now, Karen, all these groups, they're not going away either. The areas where the Burmese military are having the most problems is where the PDFs, the People's Defense Forces, are coming together with experienced, well-armed ethnic armies, like the Kachin, the Kachin Independence Army, or now you see the same dynamic happening in a part of the country which traditionally has not been affected by insurgency, Chin State on the Indian border in the West. That's now pretty much a no-go area for the Tatmadaw. So this country is coming to pieces. How bad and how irrevocable that fragmentation process is, it's too early to say. But I think what I, what I, what I would say now is what you can see in Burma is because of the problems in the center, because of the coup and the, the reaction to the coup, which is essentially a Burman on Burman issue, mm -hmm. right? Because of that problem, you are seeing groups on the edges, ethnic minorities, Rakhine, the Arakan army, the KIA in Kachin state, sh certain Shan groups, the Wa in the Northeast, the Karen, these groups on the periphery are becoming increasingly autonomous doing their own thing, right? In the case of the Wa, 100%. They run their own country within, within Myanmar, right? The Arakan army in Rakhine state on the Bay of Bengal are moving in exactly the same direction. However, the Burmans, Tatmadaw and PDFs, however they sort this out, when they're finished, they're going to be looking around and it's going to be a very different landscape because these guys on the periphery are going to be saying, well, hell, we haven't been sitting on our hands we are now running our own affairs, essentially. And what are you guys going to do about it? So would it be sort of like the United States of Myanmar? Well, in, in an, optimum, an optimum scenario, yeah, you could have some sort of a, I don't know, what do you want to call it? A confederation of the Irrawaddy, right? But that implies that the Bama, who traditionally see themselves as the real Burmese, the real Myanmar, right? are willing to accept the fact that they are no longer the top dog, right? That they are co-equals with the Kachin and the Rakhine and the Shan and the Karen and the Mon. They're just another guy on the block. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a hugely, even with the younger generation now, the, the young people who were demonstrating earlier in the year, many of whom have now picked up weapons, even for them, uh, they can talk a good talk about, yeah, a federal future, this, that, and the other. We made mistakes in the past. That was the NLD government, the older generation. We see a better future. Okay, that's fine in, in talk, but are they gonna be able to translate that into workable politics, such that the Bama simply become another ethnic group in a country which they've always seen as their country? So, so basically, it's, it's going to have to be a political solution, yeah? Uh, well, ultimately, all, all, all yeah, conflicts yeah, have to end right. with a political solution. But right now, it's, in my opinion, it's much too early to be able to see the contours of what that solution is going to be. How can ASEAN get involved in this, too? Can they make any influence, or are they, you say, no? Well, I mean, Ar 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 ASEAN, to put it bluntly, you know, grew a pair of balls in, in October when they finally 
uh, said to the junta that you have failed to go with your side of the bargain that we made in Jakarta with the emergency summit on the 24th of April, right? The five points. You agreed to that in Jakarta, but when you, Minan Lying, head of the Burmese military, went home, you started backpedaling almost within day one. We let it ride, and still you haven't helped us, right? And so come October, what do you have? Is that ASEAN says, no, you can't come to our summit, Minan Lying. You've got to send somebody else, right? You've got to send a, a non-political figure. If you can't send a non-political figure, if you can't accept the fact that the military and Minan Lying will not be the head of state, you can't come. So ASEAN has, if you like, finally stood up to be counted. It took a long time, but that's the reality today. In other words, it is not 100% given. Listen, thank you very much for your time again. You're very yeah. welcome. <laughs> Always interested it's... in your <laughs> opinions and what's going on. And I love the way you actually deal with the facts. Yeah. So uh, again, thanks very much uh, for, for joining us. Everybody, thank you very much for joining us again. Don't forget, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Uh, love to hear your comments and uh, please like and share. See you again soon.